I did a wedding yesterday, and I, uh, I, I like weddings. Um, you know, sometimes I've said I like funerals better than weddings, and you know, that's a weird thing sometimes. In a wedding, you can only mess it up, but in a funeral, usually people are feeling a little bad, and you know, you can help them, um, you know, grieve well and remember well. And if anybody knows a pastor was at a, at a wedding, chances are he's done something wrong. But at a funeral, you know, there's only upside. And I went to a wedding yesterday, but I enjoyed it. It was a couple of kids I've known for... I don't know, like six years or six and a half years. And it was down at a state park I'd never been to. And it was lots of fun. And I had to go buy some pants for the wedding. And so I went yesterday to go buy some wedding pants. And I went down to the, to the wedding pants store, which is Nordstrom Rack uh, for me, and needed to get some pants. And they were pants that I probably was only going to wear one time. So I didn't want to spend a lot of money on, uh, on pants. I wanted to, to buy some one-time only use pants. And so for me, that's about 40 bucks. That's how my budget, that, that's kind of my budget here, about 40 bucks. So I went to the Nordstrom Rack where you should be able to find some one-time use pants for $40. And um, got into Nordstrom Rack with my wife. And um, I, I realized that I had left something behind really important my glasses, because I, I can't see price tags without my glasses. And when I, can't, when I say I can't see, I mean, I literally can't see price tags. I can see you very well. Beautiful dress right there, a 4th of July dress. I can see you just fine. I just can't read price tags. I'm 53 years old. My eyes have decided that they have gotten older and um, I don't see price tags at all. I have 25 pairs of reading glasses. They're everywhere. My wife was with me. I thought, surely she's going to help me shop. And it turns out she wanted to shop in her own section and do her own thing. So there I am over there trying to determine what reasonable one use only pants are by feeling them and looking at the, the tag. I can read the, you know, like the name brands and stuff. I'm not totally blind, just um, having the issues with the, the, the numbers and the price and the important stuff like that. So I try on some pants, I buy some pants and uh, walk up to the register, assuming that they're $35 pants because that's how they felt to me when I tried them on. So I got to the register and they ran them through the little machine. It's got little writing on the little machine that I can't read without my glasses. And so I took my, my phone, turned on Apple Pay, beep, you know, it ding, went great. It went through, debit cards in good shape apparently. And I, wa I went home. When I got home, I put my glasses on and I had bought some $99 pants for which for you, you may buy $99 pants all the time. But for me, for one time use only wedding pants, 99 bucks was not within my budget. And I realized something really important. Um, I needed to be able to see a little more clearly. Sometimes people choose not to see. Sometimes we just can't see. And then sometimes you have to strain really hard to see. But seeing is important because once you see, then you have to decide. I want to tell you a story today that Jesus told, a parable of Jesus. And, and when you um, see this, we will have to decide if you choose to see it. It's a tough one. And I want you to know that it's the same exact Jesus who um, told the story of the Good Samaritan when we talked about love and grace and mercy and being a neighbor and accepting people and going to them and being with them. But this particular parable is a truth that's really difficult for us to listen to. And what I would like for you to do today is I would like for you to keep an open mind and I would like for you to try to decide whether or not you think Jesus is trustworthy and whether or not you think he tells the truth. Now, this is not a Rick telling you something that you need to know. This is a Pastor Rick telling you something that Jesus told us that we need to know. And so this is how I feel today. I don't feel like I'm standing in front of you telling you um, this story. I feel like I'm sitting with you down here on the front row and I'm listening to this and, and feeling it deeply and choosing to see it and allowing it to affect me because it's one of the more difficult stories that Jesus told. So I wanna read it to you and walk through it and then we're going to um, discuss it a little bit and it's not very festive and it's not very holiday and it's not certainly 4th of July, but it's true. And since we're talking about parables and stories of Jesus, I wanna make sure we discuss this one. I was talking to a good friend just a minute ago and he said, you know, um, I read the Bible a lot and this is a parable that I haven't read in a long time because it's easy to even forget that it's there. And it is, and it brings with it some truths that are difficult to wrestle with. And I want you to know, I feel those truths and I feel them deeply. And I wish it wasn't true. 
If I could change it, I would, but I can't. So you and I have to decide our position toward the word of God. When we get to something that's difficult, you can choose to look the other way, to change it, to not see, and end up charging something that you can't possibly pay the bill for. Or you can look and look deeply and realize that even though it's a hard truth, Jesus is trustworthy. So let's do this together. And um, there's good news coming at the end. Jesus told a parable about a certain man, a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. Jesus didn't hate rich people. Jesus loved rich people. He loved poor people. But Jesus did say that it's more difficult sometimes for a rich person to be a believer because it's harder for them sometimes to depend on God and not to be self-reliant. This particular person, when the Bible says that he was rich and that he lived in a life of luxury and dressed in purple, it means he was filthy rich. He was stupid rich. He had so much money that he didn't know uh, what to do with it, that he had more than he needed, so much more that money was never uh, a consideration. That's how the language is constructed. Get the picture? Yes. Yeah. I don't want to lose anybody yet because there may be some I lose along the way and we're not going to lose any right here at the very beginning. Unacceptable. So I want to make sure that we got everybody with us. Some of you are in the shadows, but I think we're all right together. If, even if you're not with me, if you nod and smile, it makes me feel good. So I appreciate that. Do that little 4th of July favor. He lived in luxury every day. At this gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus. Now, the parables usually don't have um, names that are, are listed. And this person's name means blessed by God, ironically. Lazarus. And when this beggar, Lazarus, when the Bible says he was laid at the gate of the rich man's house, what this literally means was he was thrown, he was tossed into a crumpled heap. That's the way the, the words, the original words, the language, that's what it communicates. Because he obviously couldn't walk. He'd been discarded by the people who loved him and was laying there at the courtyard gate, not a gate 500 feet or half a mile away from the home, but perhaps 30 feet away from where everybody lived life inside. And you have two contrasts, the very rich, self-reliant, the very poor, dependent. And Jesus is painting a picture that everybody's nodding and tracking and, and understanding and trying to make sure that he doesn't lose anybody yet. At this gate was laid a, be a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. And even the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, in some translations, it talks about the crumbs that fall from the rich man's table. They had two kinds of bread. They had stale bread that was several days old. And, and rich people would use that as napkins because they would wipe their hands and their face with it and clean up the plate with it. And they would throw it onto the floor and the dogs would grab it. That's what this man, Lazarus, was wanting so badly to be able to, to, to eat. And the dogs would come and lick his sores, which meant he was helpless. It's pretty disgusting. And then in verse 22, Jesus turns the story a little dark. He says, then the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to the side of Abraham. Now don't get caught up in the side of Abraham. Every Jew would have known for sure Abraham was going to heaven and Jesus was using Abraham as an example so that everyone understood without question that that's where Lazarus ended up. Angels carrying him was another way that Jesus was explaining or reinforcing that Lazarus, this poor man, this beggar with sores and in an unfortunate circumstance was ushered into heaven. He was in heaven. There was no question about it. And the other point is that death happens to everyone. All of us are going to die. And that's another morbid, bleak thought, right? It's like, hey, happy 4th of July. We're all going to die. Well, if that gets you going, just wait a second, because we're going to get even a little more bleak or a little more real. And then there's going to be good news at the end. All of us are going to die. We're all marching through this life, and none of us knows when our last day is going to be. Two days we don't choose or shouldn't choose the moment we're born and the moment we die. God has numbered our days. So Lazarus dies. He goes to heaven. The rich man also died and was buried. And then in this word, buried within this word, is the understanding that there was a huge funeral, that there was a celebration, and that everyone said nice things about him. That 
when they had a funeral, just like when we have funerals, we look at people's lives and we say all the things that were good, the ways they've touched us, all the people who had sort of sucked off, off of the money and the, the good graces and the stuff that this guy had leached off of him, would have come and celebrated his life, his family and friends, maybe who were left a huge inheritance, would have, you know, would have uh, uh, said nice things about him and they would have had mourners there. It would have been very civilized. And he also died. So you have two people walking through life who die. Happens to everybody happened to them in this parable. A parable is a story Jesus made up, didn't really happen. Jesus really told it. The story is something Jesus made up to illustrate a point. So both of them are died, or have died. The rich man died, he was buried. And the problem is they didn't end up in the same place. In Hades or hell, where the rich man was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him and he said, Father Abraham, he's kind of relying on his Jewish heritage here and his, the fact that he was part of the right you know, nationality and the right belief system. Have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. Now the Bible talks about three things at least being eternal. First, hell, second, heaven, same word, third, God. There's an eternal hell, there's an eternal heaven, and there's an eternal God. Shall we all exhale for just a second? Ha, <sighs> right? I didn't wanna talk about this parable today. I know lots of preachers who just pretend hell doesn't exist. And um, they figure, you know, if I don't talk about it, what's the big deal? We'll just discuss heaven because heaven's a whole lot more fun to talk about. But when I counted and did a quick count in the New Testament of the times that Jesus talked about hell, I came up with 23 times, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that Jesus himself talked about it. And um, if he talked about it, why wouldn't I? Since I love you, why wouldn't I tell you the truth? Why wouldn't I trust you to decide? So what I wanna do today is to take you to the spot where you see what Jesus says, and then you choose whether or not he's trustworthy, not me. Please don't base your opinions on me. My job is to point you to the word and to Jesus and say, you have to decide, is Jesus telling the truth? And if, or since he's telling the truth, which I wholeheartedly believe, what am I going to do about it? Because if I believe that there's a heaven and I believe that there's a hell, and I believe that all of us are walking through life and one day going to die and going to end up one of these two places, then it changes everything about the way I live. Everything. And there's no way it can't. So as we begin to develop this, we see that a rich man who was a Jew and very self-confident and self-righteous was very surprised to end up in in hell and very surprised that Lazarus, this poor beggar who he would have thought God had cursed and wasn't concerned with would have ended up in heaven. It would have blown their minds. The people listening saying impossible, inconceivable. Everybody knows that someone who has everything in this life has been blessed by God and those who don't have been cursed. And Jesus says, the reality of it is what you have in this life doesn't make any difference. The only difference or decision that really matters in this life is the decision that you choose to make about about Jesus. So this rich man is saying, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue. Just like he, by the way, wouldn't even give Lazarus the crumbs off his table. Very ironic because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides this, between us is a great chasm that's been set in place so that what those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Now don't get too caught up in the geography and the Bible doesn't teach that there's a, a heaven and a hell that you can literally see each other from and that there's a, a, a canyon that you could try to crawl through. Jesus is being figurative. He's telling a story and he's making some points that we'll reinforce here in just a minute. But just track with me, walk with me. Consider these two different people as Jesus is explaining the reality of the afterlife. 
He's explaining the reality of the fact that there is in fact a heaven and is in fact a hell. And because there isn't a heaven and is a hell, we have the responsibility to know for sure where we're going and, and also to make sure that we're involved in the process of, of kingdom work, building God's kingdom and helping people see the truth and avoid the same consequence that this named rich man had received. He said, all right, if I can't go, if I can't get out, if I can't escape, and I can't even get any momentary relief, he said, at least send Lazarus back to my five brothers because they don't know the truth. And if they die, they're going to end up where I am. And Abraham, speaking on behalf of God in this parable, he says, if somebody rose from the dead, it wouldn't make any difference. If your brothers don't believe the word of God, in their context, it was the law and the prophets, the Pentateuch, Moses and the first five books of the Old Testament, they're not going to believe somebody who was risen from the dead. He said, it's up to them. You can't go back. And the only decision that really matters is the decision that you make about Christ before you die. And so Jesus painted a pretty bleak picture. Now, the context is there were a bunch of Pharisees before this story was told who were reveling in their own self-righteousness. They had achieved everything there was to achieve in life. They had met their goals. They had created God in their own image. They had a religious system that was absolutely serving them and nobody else. And Jesus said, you think you're going to heaven, you smug religious people. You're going to be surprised who's in heaven and you're going to be surprised who's not. And you see in this story that Lazarus appealed to God's mercy, but the rich man appealed to his, I was born a Jew, into a home full of Jews, a son of Abraham. I was born into a Christian family. I was born into a Christian nation. My life was full of good works. And yet the person who relied on God's grace, ended up in, in heaven. And the one who relied on his heritage and resources and, and good works ended up in hell. It blew the people's minds. And it gave hope to people who thought that, that Jesus would never offer a way for them to spend eternity with him. But it gave a warning to those who are hyper-religious and judgmental, exclusive and proud. And when I read this story this week, I'll be perfectly transparent with you because that's the way we, that's our relationship. And decided that this was what God wanted me to talk about after asking him if I could skip it and go on to one of the fun parables, you know, about finding pearls or, you know, things we'll talk about later. Um, I examined my own heart and I'm like, God, did I, man, this is so scary to me. Did I miss something? And I just sat there with that truth. I don't want to end up like that rich man. Have I missed something in, in life? Does my heart belong to you? I walked back through that with the Lord, arrived at the conclusion that I've given myself to, to God and confess my sin and believe who Jesus is and want to follow him with my life. But I don't feel worthy to be in heaven. I feel a whole lot more like I should be over here, but I think that's the point. And I let that, that just settle with me. And then I grieved because I have friends who I love, who I don't think had their relationship right with God. And I don't even like to think about it. it makes me want to shut my Bible, tear pages out. It makes me uncomfortable. But just because I'm uncomfortable doesn't mean that it's not true. And it points me toward good news because the same Jesus who defined neighbor, who knelt down by a woman caught in adultery, ready to take the stones from religious people trying to destroy her, the same Jesus who looked at Zacchaeus in the tree and Matthew in the tax collector's booth and said, follow me, you can live a different way, is the same Jesus that provided the way, the truth, and the life so that anyone who wants to follow him can follow him. And we'll talk about that in a minute. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but here's the point that I want to leave you with before we sing. First of all, this parable is about life, death, 
and life after death, a rich man and a poor man. And Jesus said, and this is what I sat with for the first day or so this last week. Jesus told us that we should consider our own hearts, even if we're believers and think that we're Christians, because there's a passage of scripture here I want to read to you. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of my father in heaven will enter, who are right with God and have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. On judgment day, many people will say, I worked so hard for you, God. I gave so much to you, God. I attended church so often for you, God. I was a really good person. My paraphrase. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Now, we're going to discuss this in just a couple minutes. And I want to take you to a point that I said is good news. That's just absolutely permeated with grace that is characterized by mercy, surrounded by love, that gives me hope and brings me peace. But I want to set the reality up for you real quick before we sing. All of us are born and we're all born damned, right? Isn't that great? Again, happy 4th of July, right? But it's true. Now, the good news is we're the same. All of us are the same. We're all sinful, born sinful. We've all fallen short of God's standard, all of us. Now, I believe that each person reaches an age, most people, of accountability. Now, if a child dies, a baby dies, then I believe God takes them immediately to heaven to be with him. They haven't reached an age where they're responsible. But at some point, we become responsible where we know most adults, unless there's a, a mental impairment of some sort, come to a time when they understand right and wrong, they understand who Jesus is, they can make decisions for themselves. All of us are marching toward our death, whether it's just through old age, whether it's through accident, who knows? Watch a Dumb Ways to Die video. If you want some ideas, it happens to people in dumb ways and unexpectedly. At the point in time that our life is over, regardless of whether we're celebrated or forgotten, the only decision that matters is the decision we made about Jesus and that one of these two places are where we're going to end up. So remember that, and then we'll come back and we'll sort of bring this to a great, great conclusion. So we ended up with um, the reality, the understanding that heaven and hell are real and that um, all of us are headed toward one or the other and that all of us after reaching the age where we can understand right or wrong have the responsibility to choose. And I wanted to just talk for a second about some misunderstandings or you know, false views of this whole heaven and hell type thing. Um, eight, over 80% of uh, people in the United States believe that there's a heaven, and um, that's not surprising. But only about uh, 8%, sometimes the surveys are a little higher, believe that there's a hell. And most people who believe in heaven believe they're going there. Um, it's kind of called universalism. Everybody really gets to heaven. You just got to be a good person. Many paths, many roads lead to heaven. You've probably heard that. And the Bible tells us one of the truths that we know from Scripture, and one of the things that's difficult for us to wrap our minds around is that being good, just like being born in the right place or in the right home or going to church a certain number of times or anything else, doesn't get us into heaven. Um, we kind of run into to a brick wall when we hang our hope on if I'm a good enough person, then God's going to let me in. Now, first of all, as I mentioned to you a little, few minutes ago, the Bible teaches that no one's good, no, nobody, not me, not you, none of us. All of us are born sinful. All of us, every single one, that life is a sexually transmitted terminal disease. The moment we're born, we begin to die, marching toward this final decision or conclusion destination. But if it took being a good person to go to heaven, if that was true, if you believed that to tip the cosmic scales towards your favor, you had to do enough good works. How cruel would it be for a God who wrote the Bible, who gave us the blueprint for our lives to not include in scripture how much good is good enough? What is good enough? What are really good works? What's it take? How much does it take? There are times in our, in our recent history, you would agree that the entire church or most of the church would have probably ended up in hell if it took being a good person to go to heaven. There was a time not too long ago where churches in general, religion persecuted women and believed women didn't have the right to be heard and really shouldn't even be there unless they're sitting next to their husbands. We've changed 
at our understanding of scripture and realized what truly is good. There was a time when in most churches, churches believed that owning slaves were appropriate. It was the right thing to do here in America. Thank God we've come to our senses and we've realized that that wasn't good at all. But at any point in time in history, you could look at what people perceived as good, even people in the church. And if that was the criteria to get into heaven, we would look back and say most of them didn't make it. But fortunately, when we understand that heaven and hell are for real, being good has absolutely nothing to do with getting in. And that's really good because I'm not good and neither are you. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Now, some are better sinners than others. Some are pro at sin. Some are amateur at sin, right? There are all sorts of different levels in between, but none of us is good enough. It's the truth that Jesus is alluding to, the truth that we have in scripture. Adam and Eve sinned. Humankind was cursed. You and I probably would have sinned too. I know you, I know me. They sinned. Because God was loving and merciful, he put a plan in place, but because he was holy and just, he pronounced a curse on humankind that caused this life being transferred from one to the next with a death sentence and the need for intervention for a savior, for somebody to take on our sin, a perfect person who would die for us so that we didn't have to. So we see in this parable that heaven and hell are for real and a person who builds their life on the solid foundation or the rock of the gospel of Jesus Christ isn't going to crumble when the storms come. The second thing that we see as we look at this parable is that death kills our choices. That's a little bit of a morbid way to, to word it, but it, you know, it, it's pretty obvious from this parable and pretty obvious by reading scripture that once we die, we don't have the ability to choose any longer. I like choices. I don't like to be stuck. I don't like to be trapped. I kind of like to mountain bike. It depends on who I'm riding with. And I went mountain biking with a person not too long ago who's a better rider than I am. And that's not really that hard of a thing to do. It seems that almost everybody I do things with uh, are better at them than I am. And I always find myself in a spot where I'm trying to keep up. And so we're going mountain biking. And I said, how far are we going to ride? And they said, I don't know, an hour or so. I said, no, I need to know how far we're going to ride. How many miles? Where are we going to go? Where's the track? Well, why do you need to know? Because I'm going to Google it and I'm going to find out where the nearest Casey's is. And I'm going to take my cell phone and I'm going to take my wallet. And if I get tired of riding with you, I, I want out. I'm going to call my wife and I'm going to have her come get me. That's why I want to know. And so as I rode, I wasn't thinking about the end destination. I'm thinking about, okay, Casey's is up here and one and a half miles. I got a quick stop over here that's about six miles. I knew my out, my escape at any point in time. And I had my wife on the, on the other end of the phone and I had my debit card to buy a Gatorade and there was no way I was getting stuck. And I don't like the idea of being stuck, which is why this terrifies me. This story. Decisions are final when death comes for us. And the only decision that matters is the decision we make about Jesus. That's it. And it terrifies me. And it should terrify you as well. And it's what sat so heavy with me all week long. There are also some other things that we learn here. And number three, we see that we can remember like this rich man as he was in hell and regret the decision that he didn't make about Jesus his entire life. The Old Testament talks about hell having a worm or being filled with worms that would never die. And most theologians think these worms are the conscience that reminds you of you're rejecting Jesus for an eternity. Think of the worst thing you ever did. Magnify it by a hundred. How badly you want to feel better. Get out from under it and living with the reality that that's never going to happen. And then you add on top of all the other things that the Bible tells us about hell and it's a bleak picture. Or we can be like this beggar and we can remember, and I know this is a very churchy word, but I like to alliterate. We can remember and we can rejoice. The Bible tells us in Matthew 16, now what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? So here's the good news. This is the, the good news. It's what drives me, what should motivate you. It's um, the good news, the gospel 
of Jesus Christ. That Jesus did not leave us to navigate our way through this world, hoping that we can figure out how to be good enough to go to heaven. That he, because he is rich in mercy and love, didn't allow the curse to stay placed upon us with no way out, with no escape. You see this side of death, we have our quick stars and our Casey's and our cell phone and our credit card and our wife, all wrapped up in one person, Jesus Christ. And at any point in time, we can turn to him and give our lives to him. And by giving our lives to him, escape the eternity in hell and confirm our eternity in heaven. And it really happens in three very simple steps. So this is what you have to do. And it's for you to decide. This is Christianity, by the way. This is it. What do Christians believe? What did Jesus teach? Why did Jesus come? The most important set of facts you'll ever hear. I'm a sinner. I've blown it. I was born sinful, but I've gotten pretty good at it myself. I've done things, had thoughts, actions, attitudes, displeasing to the Lord, and I deserve punishment in hell. I don't understand it at all, but I get it. And I need forgiveness, God. Forgive me for my failures to you. One, a million, doesn't matter. And I'm sure each of us would acknowledge, watching online or here, my friends, myself certainly included, my wife could testify, I've sinned at least once. One sin, a million sins, sinful. Needing forgiveness. God, forgive me for my sins. I can't forgive myself. You've sent Jesus to live a perfect life, to die a death he didn't deserve, to rise again, taking on my sin, paying the price so that anyone who believes in him doesn't have to receive this, but can receive this. Forgive me. That's step one. Now, it all happens at one time, but bear with me. Step two, I believe who Jesus is. I don't understand everything there is to understand. I don't know everything there is to know, but I believe he's God's son. I believe he's your son, God. I believe he came and lived a perfect life as God and died for me. I believe he loves me. I believe it in the book of John when he says, I'm the way, I am the truth. This is Jesus, by the way, not Rick. I am the way, I am the truth. Does anybody else know the third one? I am the life. If anyone who wants to come to the Father comes through me, right, I'm the way. And he doesn't stand as a linebacker trying to keep you from entering heaven. He stands with his arms outstretched saying, won't you please come? How can I show you I love you any more than the stories that we've talked about over the last weeks together? How can I show you that you belong with me anymore? I get you. I accept you. I want you. And then the third thing is we say, I'm going to live for you. No more living for me, God. I'm living for you. My life belongs to you. I don't know what that looks like, but my life belongs to you. And that, friends, is saving faith. That diverts your trail away from heaven or hell into heaven permanently and irrevocably and allows you to live this life full of hope and meaning and joy. And I don't know any other way to tell you except tell it to you straight because I love you and the Bible tells it to us straight. So I sit with you under uncomfortable truths but real truths, unpopular truths, but timeless truths, a truth that I would suggest to you is the most important truth because it's the most important decision, a decision you will be held accountable for on your dying day, the decision that you make about Jesus Christ. And I love you and I am for you and I wanna do this with you which is why I tell you. Father, thank you for my friends. And I pray that as we close this time together, that we put on our reading glasses, that we choose to see 
the price tag and realize we can't pay, but you have. And I pray that for those of us who have already received this free gift of eternal life, realizing that we're not good enough, smart enough, right enough to be right with you, but we've received this free gift because of your grace and through our faith. For those of us who have made this decision, we thank you. Allow the weight of this truth to sit heavily on us so that we with humility and gentleness and love are driven to share this truth with the world around us by loving and serving them to a point where they can see you even in the cracks and weakness and ugliness of our lives. For those who maybe have not made a decision to follow you, Father, in this room or watching online, I pray with all my heart that they would consider this truth. It is seemingly too good to be true. But I think that's part of the definition of supernatural, Father. You are bigger than this world. You are able to forgive sin. Able in some way to look at us and love us so much that you send your son to pay the ultimate price so that I can be with you forever in heaven. We thank you for that. I thank you for my friends. And as we continue this series on the stories that Jesus told, these parables, teach us in every way and allow us to live differently based on what we learn. In Jesus' name, amen.